Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to class seven, our second week on conservatism as traditionalism. Today, we're going to be looking at the political thought of Leo Strauss, uh, the, the, uh, the German emigre to the United States uh, in the mid 20th century. Now, if you don't know anything about Leo Strauss, and most people probably don't know anything about Leo Strauss in the public world, um, you might be familiar with this name uh, being associated with the Iraq War in the mid to aughts. There was a kind of flurry of writing in both academia and in popular political commentary that tried to link Leo Strauss and his political thought to the Iraq War by virtue of his association with neoconservatism. Um, we'll be in a better position to assess these links later in the semester when we read some more explicitly neoconservative texts. Um, but we're going to talk, but for many people, this is the kind of association that they have with Leo Strauss. And so what we're going to do today is try to tease out what exactly his approach to political philosophy is. Uh, since Strauss doesn't really make any sort of positive political commitment, he doesn't really say what justice is or what the best society should be. Uh, in many ways, he sees himself as a scholar of the history of political thought. So thinking through how we get from this more scholarly approach to the history of political philosophy to the war in Iraq is going to be one of the things that we might think about this week and going forward. So our goals for today is to I want us to be able to explain his division between the classical and modern political philosophy, uh, as well as describe the purpose of political philosophy for Strauss. We're going to think about evaluating his critique of modernity and thinking a little bit about his account of natural law. Um, this lecture is going to start, as always, with a little bit of context on Strauss and his thought, uh, and then turn to the, uh, to the essays that, that I had you read for today uh, to think about the kind of what the two sorts of political philosophy are and the limits of modernity, as well as natural law and the classical tradition. So Leo Strauss uh, was born on September 20th, 1899 in a small town of Kirchen in uh, hesse nassau a province of the Kingdom of Prussia. He was born to a Jewish family. Uh, he eventually completed a doctorate in philosophy at the University of Hamburg, studying under Ernst Cassier. Um, but he also took curse, courses at the universities of Freiburg and Marburg with, uh, uh, and was introduced and immersed himself in the phenomenological tradition of uh, Edmund Husserl and Martin Heidegger. Um, at the time when he was a student, he was involved in some German Zionist movements, which introduced him to the broader kind of German Jewish intelligentsia. Um, this intellectual milieu that included Hannah Arendt, Walter Benjamin, Karl Lewis, uh, Franz Rosenzweig, and Hans-Georg Gadamer. In 19, 1932, he received a fellowship and left uh, Berlin for Paris uh, and never really returned to Germany uh, because of the rise of the Nazi party in Germany. He eventually fled to England where he was able to secure a temporary post at the University of Cambridge uh, before immigrating to the United States in 1938. He taught at the New School for Social Research in New York until 1948 and received an endowed chair uh, at the University of Chicago, which he held until 1969. He then spent a year at the Claremont McKenna College and then held a position at St. John's College in Annapolis, uh, one of these great books programs, uh, before he died in 1973 of pneumonia. And his thinking is in many ways shaped by his experience as a Jewish emigre to the United States fleeing the Nazi regime. On the one hand, Nazism seemed to be the culmination of a kind of nihilism that he associated with modernity in which traditional virtues and moral standards are forcibly erased, a kind of trope that we've been seeing throughout uh, this semester. And on the other hand, his own philosophical approach of deeply studying the tradition of political thought can be seen as a kind of secular rabbinism, uh, providing commentaries on the texts of the past as a way of advancing his, his, our own understanding. Stroud himself wrote that there is no inquiry into the history of philosophy that is not at the same time a philosophical inquiry. Um, so he's a historical thinker, but he is, uh, believes that by studying the past, we can actually generate our own thinking. So Strauss never really develops a full-blown philosophical system since most of his published work forms commentaries on the history of political thought. But at the same time, there are a series of philosophical commitments uh, throughout his work that I want to give a brief overview of that provide a little bit of context to how these essays that I had you read uh, fit into his broader philosophical project. 
And one of Strauss's key philosophical commitments is the critique of positivism and historicism, especially as applied to the social science and humanities. You probably got a sense of this in reading what is political philosophy. Um, but just some background here, positivism, at least in the social sciences and in Strauss's view, is based on a fundamental division between facts on the one hand and value claims. Uh, good science, whether natural or social, should be based on facts rather than normative or moral prescriptions. And Strauss's target here is the way in which uh, mid-century social sciences took a positivist turn, trying to develop generalizable theories about human behavior and society, modeled after theories in the natural sciences uh, that could be substantiated with rigorous quantitative data. Strauss not only thinks that this is impossible, um, that you can't separate factual claims about human society from value claims evaluating human society, um, but also that there is a clear straight line from positivism to then historicism, the idea that all beliefs and values are historically contingent and products of their time. And this, this then leads to nihilistic relativism. Because all values are historically contingent, there are no moral, political, or scientific standards beyond particular historical context. Strauss is worried that such relativism would make any sort of moral or political evaluation impossible and undermining our ability to make political judgments and, and maintain social order. Um, and the root of this problem lies in what Strauss calls the political theological predicament of modernity, or the failed attempt by early modern thinkers like Spinoza, like Hobbes, like Rousseau, to separate politics from theology or to kind of ground political society on foundations that are entirely secular and humanistic rather than based on any sort of religious foundation. Without an appeal to nature, without an appeal to the divine, it's impossible to make any claim about uh, what about how we should evaluate the best society, right? So we're moving away from the from one way of thinking about uh, politics and political thought in general, which is what is the best way to organize society. Uh, but when you get rid of these natural or, uh, or, or religious foundations, you can't really say that one society is better than the other, or one way of organizing society is better than the other. Um, and then this shifts away from a, the furthermore, shifts away from a theological conception um, that transforms natural law from a series of obligations that we have in order to be kind of compliant with nature to a set of individualistic rights. This like move from natural, and we'll talk about this later, that like the French and American revolutions treat natural law as guaranteeing a set of rights to individuals. For Strauss, then, uh, the classical tradition is valuable and we should study these, these ancient thinkers, Plato, Aristotle, Xenophon, um, Cicero, uh, Maimonides, Al-Farabi, et cetera, um, not because they have definitive answers that we should like implement in our own societies, uh, but because all of these thinkers attempted to grapple with the tensions and contradictions created by the relationship between the human order on the one hand to the natural or divine order on the other. And modern political thought, he thinks, tries to make a clean break, which he thinks only results in nihilism. And this means that this conflict for, uh, between the secular and the religious, between the philosophical quest for truth on the one hand, and the absolute truth, uh, like uh, absolute unquestioned faith in the divinity on the other, cannot and should not be resolved for Strauss. The victory of philosophy uh, leads to the nihilism of the 20th century, and yet the victory of theology would lead to, would be disastrous as it would deny the freedom of thought and freedom of questioning that philosophy and science require. Uh, he writes in his book, uh, Natural Right and History, that, quote, philosophy has to grant that revelation is possible. But to grant that revelation is possible means to grant that the philosophic life is not necessarily, not evidently, the right life. Philosophy, the life devoted to the quest for evident knowledge available to man as man, would rest on an unevident, arbitrary, and blind decision. This would merely confirm the thesis of faith, that there is no, possible, no possibility of consistency of a consistent and thoroughly sincere life without belief in revelation. The mere fact that philosophy and revelation cannot refute each other would constitute the refutation of philosophy by revelation. And so for, for, for Strauss, rather than choosing between theocracy and nihilism, he wants us to recover a kind of disposition that dwells in this conflict between religion, revelation, philosophy, truth, uh, on the other hand. And he thinks that the ancient thinkers, by kind of dwelling in these complications, uh, give us ways to think about doing so. Another thing that is in, associated with Strauss's thinking is the idea of esotericism. And part of his recovery of classical and ancient political thought involves a unique style of interpretation uh, that he made famous or infamous, depending on your 
uh, point of view in his essay, Persecution and the Art of Writing. He argued that many philosophical texts, especially political philosophical texts, contain both a public or exoteric teaching and a private secret esoteric teaching. The public teachings are intended to be banal and provide wisdom to the masses, but don't fundamentally challenge the existing order or the existing forms of knowledge. The esoteric writings um, have this hidden meaning that's supposed to be grasped only by a few select disciples um, and is hidden behind layers of meaning and contradiction. Esoteric writing serves several purposes for Strauss. It can protect the philosopher from retribution of a regime. It can protect the regime from the corrosion of philosophy. It attracts the right type of reader to philosophy. Only someone, uh, only someone worthy, right, of these hidden truths is able to get into the depth to find this hidden meaning. Uh, and he thinks that we can only really know, he doesn't think that all texts have this esoteric meaning. Uh, it's gonna depend on the context. But one of the things that the uh, uh, inter historian or interpreter of political philosophy should be doing is grappling with this esoteric meaning um, as doing so will help your own develop your own wisdom not necessarily because it is the wisdom of that esoteric meaning but kind of like trying to uncover all of these layers and layers and layers of hidden truths will spur your own thinking um, in many ways strauss however is more famous for his intellectual lineage than his own writings and scholarship and much of the controversy around strauss stems from this intellectual children on the one hand, Strauss has either taught or influenced a large number of political theorists and philosophers who were trained at the University of Chicago in the 60s and 70s. Of these theorists, a group of became almost disciples of Strauss in his approach to political philosophy and studied the classic of, of political thought as posing perennial questions that had to be constantly grappled with, rather than understanding them as particular interventions or responses to their own historical or political challenges at the time. Many Straussians formed a kind of conservative cohort in political theory, despite the um, at least center left to leftist bent of most political theorists. Thinkers like Henry Joff, Harry Jaffa, sorry, who tried to develop an Americanization of Strauss's defense of natural law, ended up working as a speechwriter for Barry Goldwater. Alan Bloom published The Closing of the American Mind, which offered one of the first critiques of the ways in which philosophy and the humanities were rejecting the core ethical project of the university and Western civilization. Uh, and Harvey Mansfield, the Harvard, Harvard professor who would go on to write the book Manliness, uh, criticizing the gender neutral society. And all three of these took classes with Strauss uh, at the University of Chicago uh, and took Strauss's thought in a more politi explicitly political and partisan direction. And on the other hand, as I suggested earlier, uh, Strauss has also been accused of giving birth to neoconservatism and providing the intellectual justification for the war in Iraq. Uh, these critiques are based on the fact that Paul Wolfowitz uh, attended lectures by Strauss while he was at the University of Chicago, as well as the congruence of claims of influence by many neoconservative thinkers. And we'll be able to evaluate these when we read some of Crystal's work later in the semester. Uh, but it's difficult to draw a straight line here between neoconservatism's claim that America has a history defining purpose and Strauss's own work. So I encourage you to think about whether or not there are actually some congruences in, in here. Um, this is a great time if you need to take a, a break uh, before uh, we move on to the essays proper. So take a, take, pause the video, take a break, and we'll reconvene in just a second. So what is political philosophy for Strauss? In the essay, what is political philosophy? Strauss begins his account of political philosophy with a fairly unique definition of politics. For him, all political action has in it been in itself a directedness towards knowledge of the good, the, of the good life or of the good society. It's essentially, a, it's a, it, politics then isn't about who gets what, when, and how, as that is for contemporary political scientists, uh, nor is it about power, authority, and consent, uh, as we would suggest in the modern tradition, but it's essentially about how to guide people to the good life. For Strauss, Plato and Aristotle essentially get politics right, at least in their understanding of what politics are. Uh, philosophy then for Strauss is a quote, quest for wisdom, a quest for universal knowledge, for knowledge of the whole, the attempt to replace opinions about the whole by knowledge of the whole. It's essentially a quest for absolute knowledge uh, that is true and capacious and, and, and conforms, concerns not things in their particular, but how everything fits together. This conception of philosophy presupposes, first of all, that there is a coherent whole, 
uh, that fits together and that everything can be related into an overarching system. Now Strauss insists that this on the same page that philosophy doesn't possess this knowledge necessarily, but is a quest. Uh, it is a quest for this knowledge and that quest presupposes that this knowledge must exist even if no philosopher ever could possess this knowledge. Uh, and then according to Strauss, then political philosophy, according to Strauss, is the attempt truly to know both the nature of political things and the right or the good political order. The goal of political philosophy then is to define, define the right political order, or this, and this presupposes that there is something like a right answer to how should politics be structured. Um, like for de Meister, it is not itself, uh, it is not purely the work of human hand, but relies on something outside itself. Um, and then according to Strauss on page 17, this conception of philo political philosophy, which he traces back to the ancients for whom political philosophy was identical with political science and was an all embracing study of, uh, uh, of human affairs has been supplanted by more scientific studies of politics. No one tries to answer the, uh, study the political world with an eye towards overarching purpose or to answer these hard questions, which is what is the right way to organize a political system. And the decline of political philosophy is rooted in the dynamics we've already talked about, positivism and historicism. With the former, um, with the former political philosophy is rejected as unscientific. It's, uh, it confuses facts and values. It's not making objective claims about the world. Judgments about what the best political regime are is inherently a value judgment, not a claim of objective truth. Uh, and with respect to historicism, any claim about the best political regime is always going to be historically contextualized. There is no absolutely best political regime, uh, if, according to historicism, as there are no universal or trans-historical standards by which we could evaluate which regime is the best. Any claim is going to be a product of its time. And so this leads to Strauss's kind of demarcation between two different solutions to political philosophy or two different ways of articulating this. Uh, the classical solution for him begins with an emphasis on nature. Uh, for Strauss, a key aspect of the classical tradition is this emphasis on nature and the belief that he writes on page 27 that a human being is said to be natural if he is guided by nature rather than convention or by inherent opinion or by tradition to say nothing of mere whims. Uh, the goal of the classical tradition was to find the best life of human being for human beings based on their nature rather than conceived, uh, contrived opinion or haphazard tradition. And so there's a tension here between the skeptical tradition and Strauss, and Strauss does think that there's a right answer to, uh, to these questions. He also thinks that the, the, the political philosopher in the classical tradition wasn't looking outside from the outside in on society, but was from the position of an elder statesman. Here we have a similarity with Burke and Oakeshott on the importance of experience and apprenticeship. Strauss des describes this perspective on page 28 as distinct from the disinterested spectator, uh, the technician, the fanatic, or the lawyer, but from someone who has been involved in politics all their life and for whom the answers matter. Ultimately, Strauss writes on page 34 that classical political philosophy is guided by the question of the best regime. This is because it understands idea and action and life itself aiming towards some end, and therefore social life must be organized around some end or goal. The regime is that which gives order to the social world and gives it its purpose. As he continues on 34, life is activity which is directed towards some goal. Social life is activity which is directed towards, uh, towards a goal that can be pursued only by society, but in order to pursue a specific goal as comprehensive goal, society must be organized, ordered, constructed, constituted in a manner which is in accordance with that goal. And so the particular organization and constitution of society constitutes that regime. Uh, and he thinks that political philosophy is trying to find the best regime anywhere, everywhere, universally. And, and finally, Strauss notes that the classical approach to political philosophy is also concerned with the question of cosmology or natural philosophy. And it's again, trying to figure out how human beings relate to nature, the cosmos, the universe as a whole. So these questions which would be rejected in kind of contemporary political science are necessary for uh, classical political thought. The moderns, however, despite their diversity between Locke, Hobbes, Machiavelli, Rousseau, Kant, um, they are all united by their rejection of the classical approach. The attempt to theorize the correct ordering of the regime and the proper ends of human life was rejected as idealistic. Instead, modern political philosophers like Machiavelli, Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, try to provide more realistic accounts of political orders that would preserve human beings uh, in their security uh, for Hobbes or uh, against the, the, the badness of men for Machiavelli. Uh, or for Locke, they preserve their property. This means a rejection of ideals of virtue, um, and, and, and Strauss calls this a lowering of standards. That the goal is not the ideal regime, um, but a regime that can best control what he calls the evils of humans. As he writes, according to Machiavelli, 
uh, men are bad, they must be compelled to be good. Similarly, Hobbes, right, polit political, philosoph political philosophy is premise not on virtue, uh, and political life is not about the virtuous life, but it's about self-preservation and order. Then this, this also means that political philosophy divorces itself from questions of theology and natural law. This is best seen in Strauss's account of Rousseau, who replaces natural law with the general will. And the implication here is that if the ultimate criterion of justice becomes the general will, uh, this is Strauss speaking, the will of a free society, cannibalism is just as, is as just as its opposite. Every institution hollowed by folk mind has to be regarded as sacred. So for Strauss, this last idea points to the problem with modernity's rejection of the classical solution. For Strauss, the modern approach reaches its culmination in the thought of, of Friedrich Nietzsche, who, who in Strauss's re reading, um, uh, preached the, the sacred right of merciless extinction of large masses of men with little restraint. Uh, once this idea, once the idea and this in the search for timeless universal truths about humanity's proper nature are rejected, everything becomes fair game. And Strauss describes Nietzsche as presenting either an irresponsible withdrawal from politics in favor of perpetual self-experimentation, uh, as encouraged by uh, modernity's rejection of the true political questions, or as an irresponsible politics of domination and violence. So how do we get here? Part of Strauss's uh, explanation is modernity's obsession with positivism, which he argues attempts to embrace a kind of ethical neutrality. This neutrality isn't itself nihilistic, but he says it fosters conformism and philistinism, that we no longer are willing to make ethical judgments because we want to separate facts from values uh, and we can't have objective ethical judgments anymore. This conformism to the will of the majority means that no one questions authority or challenges the dominant trends of society. When positivism, positivism becomes historicism for Strauss, this becomes even worse as, it re, as historicism rejects the question of the good society and insists that there is no essential necessity for raising the question of the good society. That's on page 26. Once this question is rejected, there isn't really a way to evaluate changing historical forces, but everything just becomes blind movement of fate. As he concludes on page 27, it was contempt for these, per, uh, sorry, for these permanencies, which permitted the most radical historicist in 1933 to submit to, or rather welcome, as a dispensation of fate, the verdict of the least wise and least moderate part of his nation, while it was in, uh, while it was in the least wise and least moderate mood, and at the same time to speak of wisdom and moderation. The biggest event of 1933 would rather seem, seem to have proved, if such proof was necessary, that man cannot abandon the question of the good society and that, and that he cannot free himself from the responsibility for answering it by deferring to history or to any other power different from his own reason. Strauss here isn't saying that Nazism, this, this great event of 1933, is the inevitable result of modern political thought, but that modern political thought lacked the resources to resoundingly reject and, uh, Nazism. Uh, that the failure of modernity to prevent Nazism is proof for Strauss of the impotence of modernity and the importance of raising questions of the good society, even if we can't ever provide full answers. Now, he then turns to natural law as an alternative to modern positivism and historicism. And he writes in the essay on natural law, um, page 137, by natural law is meant a law which determines what is right and wrong and has a power or valid by nature uh, inherently, hence everywhere and always. Natural law is higher law, but not every higher law is natural. That is, laws, uh, virtues, justice, rights are not constructed by political societies through either a social contract or a Hayekian ev evolutionary process. Instead, there's something beyond positive law that we could use to evaluate natural law. It's something timeless, universal, and, and, and objective. And in the essay, uh, Strauss traces the development of natural law tradition, beginning with the Greek discovery of nature, uh, that nature has a universal order and purpose. Uh, this was invented according to Strauss by the Greeks. And this idea came with it, the idea that nature was inherently good and that uh, hence Plato's Republic argues that a just city is organized in accordance with nature. And, and Aristotle speaks of the unchanging law of, of nature. This gets developed in Stoicism with the idea of providence This uh, in, in the Hellenistic and Roman periods in which the unchanging trajectories of nature become um, a kind of sign of God's will and the divine providence and that the proper virtuous person kind of accommodates themselves to divine providence. Uh, and this becomes Christianized with Thomas Aquinas in the medieval periods with the Summa Theologica, which tries to reconcile Christian revelation with Aristotle's philosophy to show that the truths of divine revelation are not arbitrary, but that the natural divine law is in accordance with human reason. But this all changes in the modern period as seen most strong, strikingly in the French and American Revolution, which for Strauss um, shift the meaning of, uh, of, nat 
natural law from, dec from declarations of obligation to declarations of rights, uh, transforming natural law from a system of duties to a set of rights. And Strauss, again, here in this essay, never calls for returning to the ancient conception of natural law. I'm not even think, sure he thinks we could do that, that we could like overcome or undo or reverse the Enlightenment. But he does raise this alternative as a provocation for thinking. He wants us to think about what is gained and what is lost in this rejection of natural law. So as you finish up the readings and get ready for discussion section this week, some questions to consider. Is Strauss's critique of historicism and positivism persuasive? What's valuable in it and what's not? Do you think that he can that his clear dividing line between ancient and modern political thought is correct? Is it useful? And what makes Strauss a conservative? How does his thinking fit into the trends that we've discussed so far? Um, and a quick Easter egg, uh, an extra credit to ensure that you all are watching in, to the end of these videos. Uh, you can earn three points back on your lowest graded assignment this semester uh, by completing the following by October 5th. Uh, at 5 p.m. Pacific time. Take an idea, theory, concept, quote, or thinker uh, that we've studied this semester and so far and turn it into a meme of any format you like and email that meme to me by October 5th at 5 p.m. This you can email it to me as an image file. Um, and that will be it for our pre this pre-lecture on Strauss. Uh, we'll get into the meat of these uh, essays and look at these a little bit more closely and see if we can answer some of these questions about whether Strauss is in fact a conservative or not um, in discussion section this week. Uh, till then, take care and I will see you on Monday or Wednesday.